Welcome back to Voices from Healthcare. Every other week, I seek to paint healthcare in vivid color as I learn more about the human side of medicine. In this episode of Voices from Healthcare. Yeah, you know, I think for nurses, working in healthcare um, and being you know, so close to the patient who is ultimately the person that we're trying to see the best outcome for, you know, nurses intuitively understand the strengths and the weaknesses and the challenges that exist in our medical systems our workflows, our processes, our products, like they intuitively know all this stuff just because they work with it every single day. And so they really understand it really well. And nurses are the largest group of healthcare professionals um, in the country, you know, over 4 million nurses in the USA. Um, so when we think about how do we really improve a complex healthcare system that really has so many needs, because there's a lot going on in healthcare that needs to be changed and needs to be improved to be sustainable and better. Um, nurses understand the system so well. They're so passionate about what they do and they have the training to do this, you know, through different degrees. Um, so I think when you, when I think about healthcare innovation, I think nurses and really other clinicians too should really be at the forefront of healthcare innovation um, because virtually anything that we want to implement across healthcare settings is going to involve nurses. It's going to involve our other clinicians. So we should be right there helping to design these things, giving our input um, and making sure that what we create really works when you put it into the real world. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode. Today I sit down with Abby Hess, nurse practitioner, clinical researcher, and entrepreneur. She majored in psychobiology as an undergraduate at Center College and began her career at Cincinnati Children's as a research assistant in 2005. She continued to work in the research lab while going back to nursing school, ultimately completing a bachelor and master's in nursing and later the doctor of nursing practice degree. Clinically, Dr. Hess works with the Department of Anesthesiology as a family nurse practitioner after completing her doctoral degree, she worked with leadership to create a dual role that has included research and innovation, in addition to seeing patients. Her research centers around the development and testing of evidence-based digital health solutions for the reduction of pediatric preoperative anxiety. She has been the principal investigator on eight research innovation grants was the winner of the first Johnson & Johnson Nurses Innovative Quickfire Challenge in 2019 and is the current chair for the American Nurses Association's Innovation Advisory Committee for Technology and Devices. Her story shares the pursuit of finding a career that you're truly passionate about and the excitement and challenge of being a clinician, researcher, and innovator in healthcare. It is such a joy to explore your unique work today. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Hess. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. I want to start off with the beginnings and look into the early stages of your career. Were you always drawn to working in healthcare from a young age or was this developed over time? Yeah, so, you know, some people know just what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, this was definitely not me. <laughs> um, I learned at a young age, though, that going to work doesn't have to be something that you just do for 40 hours a week and then look forward to the weekend and then do it all over again. <laughs> um, you know, it can be something that you're energized by and really excited to be a part of. Uh, my parents were both entrepreneurs. They ran a business together up in Acadia National Park in Maine, and they did horse and carriage tours for a living through the National Park. <laughs> Wow. Um, and this was a dream for them. You know, it was a hobby that turned into a business that they did for over 20 years. And so that was something I saw growing up was people coming to work, getting to do something they loved, something that they loved even in their spare time and they're getting paid for it. It was hard work. Definitely working with horses is a lot, um, <laughs> but it was really cool to see that. And so, you know, I didn't figure out until later what I wanted to do for a career, actually until after I graduated college even. <laughs> um, but I think that because I was searching for work that wouldn't necessarily feel like work, but something that I was excited to get up and do every day, I think that's why it took me a while to figure out like what the right fit was for me. <laughs> for sure. 
In terms of your educational journey, so <laughs> after you graduated college, you applied for research in Australia, and you ended up working in the genetics research lab at Cincinnati Children's. Could you just explain how you found yourself in the place of a research assistant at Children's in those early years of your career? Oh, for sure. Um, so as you mentioned, I went to Center College. I studied psychobiology. Uh, in the summer after my junior year of college, I got to do an internship at a genetics research laboratory up in Maine, um, where my parents lived, called the Jackson Laboratory. And I was just so fascinated by working in the lab environment and learning the process of how we could learn more about human diseases through studying mice. Um, that's a lot of what they do at the Jackson Laboratory is mouse genetics. <laughs> um, and so just a little bit about that, you know, mice are actually the most commonly used animal model for studying human disease, like for many different reasons, because they're kind of biologically very similar to humans. They get a lot of the same diseases we do for the same genetic reasons. And so I was just so fascinated about how we could take these ideas um, from, you know, how do we study something in a mouse model and take it all the way to improving human health. So that was super interesting to me. Um, I love the lab uh, and I thought that I also wanted to do something in patient care, maybe do something in research, but this was really fuzzy. I didn't really know what that would look like at all. Uh, so after I graduated from Center College, I just decided I'm going to work for a while and try to figure this out because I'm done with college and I still don't know what I want to do <laughs> for a career. Um, and so I applied for a lot of different things. When I graduated, I applied to um, the Fulbright, the Fulbright program in Australia um, to do uh, medical research. I applied to teach um, in Boston at a um, charter school where I would be working with high school students um, and helping them to achieve their goals and get to college and, you know, working probably a lot with the sciences. I applied to the Jackson Lab where I had been working up in Maine and then I applied to Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, also to do research. So I was kind of all over the place, like all these different <laughs> opportunities that looked exciting and, um, you know, was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And so ultimately, I was offered the job at Cincinnati Children's in a research lab, um, which I was super excited about um, because this would allow me to also explore different careers in healthcare so I could continue working in the lab, which I knew was exciting and fun, but also think about what do those next steps look like in this career and where do I really belong and what would I be super excited about. Um, so that's kind of how I ended up at Cincinnati Children's and started working mm -hmm. here back in 2005. Wow. And like you're saying, you were looking for something that's not that typical nine to five, but something that is innovative, something that combines research, and it does take time to find that and to pinpoint exactly what kind of profession would yield that type of job. Um, so during that time, you also went back to school to pursue your Bachelor of Nursing degree at the University of Cincinnati while working part time at Cincinnati Children's as that research assistant. Uh, you worked with um, Kim Rizma. And you saw how Dr. Rizma was effective with combining research as well as clinical practice. Could you just talk a little bit about how your work with Dr. Rizma inspired you to start considering that hybrid role between clinical research nurse and a researcher as well? Yeah, so after working for about three years in the research lab, um, I had been exploring career pathways and shadowing different people. Um, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, PhD scientists, just having all these conversations and really learning what people do um, in their day-to-day -day job and what they love about it, what they don't love about it, and trying to figure out where I fit. Um, and so I actually had several friends who were going back to nursing school. And so this was a pathway that I became really interested in as I learned more about why they decided to go to nursing school. And then I had the opportunity at Cincinnati Children's to shadow a nurse practitioner for a day. And after you know talking with nurses, shadowing this nurse practitioner, learning about the schooling, I thought this is a perfect fit for me clinically like this is just exactly um, where I belong and what I want to do and so while I was in nursing school um, I could only work part-time because I was doing full-time nursing <laughs> school so I continued to work at Cincinnati Children's but I switched labs um, so that I could have a part-time position here and that's where I met Dr. Rizma and started working with her lab so Dr. Rizma is an MD PhD and she mm -hmm. saw patients in the clinic and was also conducting research studies to create new knowledge in the field of immunology 
And so I was really fascinated by how her knowledge from clinical practice really helped inform her research trials and then how her research knowledge would then enhance her clinical practice too. I just thought this was the coolest kind of back and forth in terms of what she was able to do day to day and kind of running back and forth between seeing patients and coming back to the lab and working with you know me as a research assistant. It was just really exciting mm -hmm. and inspiring. And so I thought, this is so cool. I wonder if I could do something like this in the field of nursing. Um, and when I talked with Dr. Risma about my future career as a nurse, um, she always saw more in me than I saw in myself. Mm -hmm. She helped me see possibilities that I hadn't really thought of, like having a dual role as a nurse practitioner and a clinical researcher. And just her, her example and her enthusiasm for her work and her belief in me, it just really changed the way that I saw myself and what I thought I could do in the future in healthcare. That's so neat. <laughs> and it's so valuable to have that mentorship and to uh, be in that role of learning from people who are already in the field and who are further along and they can definitely inspire you and influence your path and journey. <laughs> so that's that's neat to hear Dr. Rizma's role um, in your professional development as well. So you began to forge that new path within the hospital and you begin to find that you can do research and clinical practice as a nurse practitioner, uh, not just as an MD. Could you explain for us how you began to pursue a DNP degree? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the DNP degree, this was after I became a registered nurse and after I'd started working clinically as a nurse practitioner. I loved both of these roles, but was still thinking, you know, kind of what else could I do in these roles that would be exciting and additional in addition to clinical practice. And so after I had just started working as a nurse practitioner, um, Cincinnati Children's sent out an email to nurses saying that they were looking to support nurses who wanted to go back to school and pursue the Doctor of Nursing Practice degree. I had just finished my master's, I had just passed boards, and then there's like this email like, oh, do you want to come and hear about this? Uh, and my husband was like, don't go to that meeting, like, <laughs> you're going to go back to school, aren't you? Jokingly, he's always been very supportive, actually. Right. But, um, so I was like, no, I'm just going to go and hear about it and learn about this degree and this program and figure out, you know, a little bit more about it. Um, and so when I went to the meeting and when I learned about what DMPs get to do, my first reaction was, you know, um, I, I don't know if I'm ready to jump back into school, <laughs> but then I learned what this degree was all about and talked about it with my family and I was just sold. Um, so the DMP degree was created to prepare nurse leaders at the highest level of nursing practice to improve patient outcomes and really translate research into practice. Mm -hmm. So there is so much research out there, right? You do a Google search and you get how many hits if you, you know, search anything in medical research. It's right. endless. And there's so much that never actually gets translated or applied into practice because we do have so much information out there. And it's really a whole different science to be able to not just generate research, but to be able to get it to the bedside where it can actually improve outcomes. And so the DMP degree really provides education in evidence-based practice, so making sure that we're using research and evidence to deliver the best care, quality improvement, you know, how do we improve care and outcomes, and systems leadership, among several other areas. And so when I learned about the curriculum for this degree, I felt like I had found my calling. <laughs> um, you know, and I really, I had so much fun the three years I was in this program. It was challenging, it was a lot of work, but it was just super cool <laughs> like to, to get to learn all of this and think about how it could be applied in the future in healthcare. Um, and it's just been a super cool journey since then, really working to build a role within my hospital that leverages this DMP skill set to its fullest. <laughs> That's so neat in that applied research. You're right that sometimes we can perform research studies and then they just remain isolated and without clinical practice, but that integration is so valuable. Could you describe for us some key differences between a PhD degree and a DNP degree? Sure, yeah, I mean, we could do like probably a whole podcast talking about <laughs> just those two roles. For sure. Because like most things in nursing, there's so many different things that nurses can do as PhDs and DNPs. But when you think about just kind of the broader um, sort of definitions and what they teach you in these degrees, the nursing PhD is really research focused and it prepares nurses to be leaders in scientific research. The DNP prepares nurses to apply and translate research into practice, improve healthcare quality and outcomes. So those are kind of the broader focuses of the two. Um, 
you know, while it's important to think about the differences in these degrees, I think understanding the synergy between them is so important because research is really a continuum. You know, when you think about research, a lot of people imagine like this lab and this scientist in this lab <laughs> coat and test tubes and all those types of things. You know, that's kind of more the basic science research in the laboratory. <laughs> um, but this spectrum goes all the way through several different phases to translation and the practice in population health. Um, and so the DNP degree is really focused at those later ends, like the translation mm -hmm. and improving outcomes in that section of research. That's, um, yeah, that's really neat. It's good to get that difference too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think when I was an undergrad, I didn't really know there were all of these different phases of research. Mm -hmm. I sort of had a, a kind of a narrower definition of what I thought it would be. So it was really cool to learn <laughs> that there was so much more to that. Um, you know, and I think because like research is a spectrum, to get ideas into practice, you really need to build different types of teams depending upon the phase of research that you're working on to help rigorously design and execute totally different types of studies. Uh, so when you think about the DNP and the PhD degrees in nursing, they really have complementary skill sets that are ideal for advancing science. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. While you were pursuing that DNP degree, you had the opportunity to work on a project that was clinically focused. Uh, from this work, you wrote an article titled, The Child Induction Behavioral Assessment Tool, a tool to facilitate the electronic documentation of behavioral responses to anesthesia inductions. Could you touch on this project a little bit and how it helped bridge your work as a DMP student to a more formal role as a clinical researcher? Sure, yeah. So I think one of the cool things about the DMP degree is you do a project that's very clinically focused and it's not just theoretical. You're actually like diving into your clinical setting and working to do something that is impacting outcomes for your patients. So that was something that I loved is that it's super applied from the start. And so you begin to think about what's a problem that I see in my area that I want to work on and solve and is there evidence already out there that can help me solve it. And so when I started working as a nurse practitioner with our anesthesia department, um, I saw lots of kids who had repeat anesthetics, so kids with kind of chronic health conditions, and they would come back, you know, weeks at a time, months at a time, years at a time, just like different time periods, but they would come back. And one of the big things that we work on before kids go back for surgery is anxiety management. Are there interventions that I can do that'll help this child to be less scared when they go back into the operating room? I want to look a little bit into clinical practice. Before you started working in your current position, you served as a registered nurse in the PACU. Could you bring us into that world a little bit? Sure, yeah. So my current role, nurse practitioner in the preoperative clinic, I'm seeing kids before surgery. My role as a registered nurse, I was in the PACU or post-anesthesia care unit. So kids immediately after surgery, like right when they're waking up from anesthesia. Um, and so we're caring for patients right when they're waking up, coming out of anesthesia, emerging, um, and you're really getting them to a place where they're stable and safe to either be discharged home or to go to a unit where they don't require as intensive monitoring as they do when you're in the PACU. Uh, so I love this role because you saw so much, you know, every different type of surgery, kids of all different ages, um, all different medical histories, so much, and then they roll out of the operating room and then they're yours <laughs> to, you know, to, to help shepherd them through this really, um, you know, challenging moment when you're first emerging and coming to and starting to hear things and starting to see things and like, what just happened? I just had surgery. What's going on? <laughs> and if you can imagine kids, you know, everything from a baby to teenagers and adults, it's different at every developmental stage, what kids experience as they're waking up from anesthesia and how they process mm -hmm. that. So it was a ton to learn. Um, but it was so interesting because, you know, with this role, when patients came out to you in the PACU, they may still be intubated, um, or you may still be managing their airway and helping them breathe with a mask. 10 mm. minutes later, you get their parents back to the bedside and they're snuggling with them and eating a popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> so you really get to do, you know, some of the more critical care skills all the way to, you know, getting to discharge the patient home within 45 minutes sometimes. Wow. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Um, but in PACU, you do management of airway and breathing, you do pain management, nausea management, you're closely monitoring vital signs, the surgical sites, the lines, the drains, the airways that they have, you know, kind of just like everything all at once. So it's a whole lot and it's different for every type of patient and surgery on um, what exactly you need to do. 
Um, but it was a super cool role and a really collaborative team. You know, everybody mm-hmm. in the PACU was right there to help you and support you with anything you needed for your patient. So I enjoyed getting to do that role. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat. Uh, currently, uh, you work as a nurse practitioner with anesthesia. Could you share for us just a little bit more about the nurse practitioner role in general and what you do kind of on a day-to-day basis? Sure. You know, the nurse practitioner role, we can have, like nursing, such a wide variety of roles also. Um, And the specifics actually vary by state uh, with nurse practitioners. Um, But in general, you know, we can assess, diagnose patients, prescribe medications. You know, we can do all of that management for patients, which is great. Um, You know, some people are working in outpatient settings. Some of us are working in the hospital settings. There's sort of everything in between. So there's lots of different roles with nurse practitioners. Um, And then there's specialties within being a nurse practitioner. Um, So family nurse practitioner, critical care, pediatric nurse practitioner, psychiatric. So there's a whole lot of different um, roles. So if you talk to 10 different nurse practitioners, (laughs) you'll get 10 very different answers um, in what they do day to day. Um, My role is kind of unique. Um, We work with the Department of Anesthesiology. We're seeing the patients preoperatively before they go back for surgery. So we're completing a full health history because you want to know what's going on with all the body systems before you put a patient (laughs) under anesthesia. Right, right. Um, And then we're doing a physical assessment to make sure they sound healthy and look good and are optimized to go back to have surgery. Um, If needed, we can order medications. A lot of times we order things for anxiety, um, sometimes for breathing, like albuterol, to make sure the lungs are good and ready to go. (laughs) Um, We also may do diagnostic tests as indicated before we go back. And then we're working really closely with the anesthesiologist to determine is this patient safe to proceed um, and then develop an optimal plan for them as they go back to have anesthesia. So like the PACU, I enjoy this role because there's so much diversity. Again, I'm seeing patients of all ages, all different medical conditions, all types of surgeries. I work with over 60 anesthesiologists. And so it's a huge team. Um, It's a well-oiled machine. It's super busy. It's fast paced, um, Mm -hmm. but it's a really great group to work with. And it's really rewarding, I think, because it's such a high anxiety day for families and patients when you come in for surgery. So to be that calming presence that's helping them to, you know, understand what's about to happen and talk with them about it and make sure that they know that we're looking out for their child. We're going to be there every second um, of the way, and we'll get them back into their arms as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> like Just getting yeah. to be there for families, I think, is really rewarding. And for them to see that you are that calming presence, <laughs> because it is a very anxious thing to know that something may be wrong with their child, and they're bringing them in, and they want that problem to be fixed. And if you're that calming presence, and they know that you're doing the best that you can, it's very, very comforting to the families. Um, We've talked about it a little bit before, about how uh, you've entered into this hybrid nursing role between a nurse as well as a researcher. So you have that unique position of marrying the roles between a nurse practitioner and a researcher. Could you give us a window into what a week in your life may look like, how you may balance research as well as clinical practice? Sure. Um, No two weeks are the same. I'll say that. (laughs) Even in my clinical role, you know, I I share that we take care of so many different patients with different medical histories, different types of surgeries, different types of ages. So I joke, you know, with anesthesia, we ask the same 20 some odd questions and we get a million different answers (laughs) and have to come up with a plan, you know, based upon the answers that we get. Um, So that's super fun on the clinical side. So clinically, I see patients three days a week. Um, The other two days, I'm focusing on research and innovation, quality improvement type of work. Um, So that's varied across the years. It's really dependent upon the type of project that I'm working on, but just kind of a high level um, with the clinic or with the non-clinical work with research. um, I work collaboratively in designing new research studies or quality improvement studies. Um, I write grants, which before I actually wrote a grant, I thought that sounded like the most boring thing (laughs) that anyone could choose to do is to like write this big long paper about, you know, getting money to support a project. But when you love the project and you're super excited about getting to do it, it actually is really fun. Like I can get lost in writing a grant and it doesn't even feel like work just because I'm like, this is such a cool project. And if we get to do this, it's going to, you know, have such great, you know, outcomes potentially and help change things in this way. Mm -hmm. So um, grant writing is more fun than I ever (laughs) expected it might be. I did not like writing papers in school at all. (laughs) Um, Also write manuscripts. So, you know, talking about our research and sharing it and getting it out there. 
um, doing presentations. I think that's super fun, especially now with COVID that we're back to doing live presentations and you get to meet people who are doing really cool work all across the country and across the world. I think that's super fun part of the research role and learn from them. I think that's the greatest thing is getting to learn from other people's practice to improve your own. Um, and then, you know, working directly with like research coordinators, you know, the type of role that you got to do as a summer student mm -hmm. <laughs> last year at Cincinnati Children's, um, you know, the, the team members who are designing the research studies always need a lot of support and help in that research assistant role is critical to us being able to recruit patients and manage data and all of that. So those are just a few of the things that I've gotten to do in the research role. That's amazing. Um, it can sometimes be difficult to measure success in your position as your care with every patient can vary. Um, could you talk about how you evaluate success in your unique position? I know you've mm -hmm. talked before about the behavioral assessment tool, but mm -hmm. is there anything else that comes into play uh, with looking at a patient's success after surgery? Yeah, sure. You know, I think a lot of hospitals, you know, we have different quality metrics, which is great because we sort of have you know, here is what we should meet with certain things and everybody works to meet them. So there are some things like that that are kind of concrete that you're looking to um, meet in terms of your charting and outcomes and things like that. Um, but then I think the great part with healthcare too is it's individualized to every single patient and family also. You know, it's, it's shared decision making. You're looking to understand what the families value, what they're looking for, you know, what's helpful to them. Um, and then, you know, really helping to come up with a plan that meets that. Um, some things are more black and white depending upon what you're talking about, but you know, for example, something that can be really gray is anxiety management. You know, some people are like, I don't want a medication for anxiety. I just want you to talk to me and calm me and just help make this easier. Others are like, absolutely, that would be extremely helpful for me. Um, and then kids, when you think about anxiety ma um, management for them, like, a two-year-old is really different than a 15-year-old, right? Right, um, right? So you're really kind of customizing what you do um, to, to collectively sort of figure out with the families what would be success for this patient and family in this situation and you have that shared decision making um, with them which I think is really great. <laughs> and have you seen your undergraduate degree in psychology and biology play a role in your clinical practice? Absolutely. I think that time was definitely not wasted at yes, all. Yes, yes. Um, so my undergraduate degree, psychobiology, um, they also call this degree in some places, I think our universities changed it also, it's um, behavioral neuroscience. So really it's looking at the biological basis of behavior and cognition. Um, so I think that's super interesting and important, you know, when you think about medicine, nursing, what we do, how we think, why we think, how different medications and diseases, you know, can impact that. Um, I think psychobiology is just super, um, super applicable when you think about kind of everything we do. And psychology, you know, in particular, too, I think just anytime you work with people, psychology is, <laughs> is really helpful just to have that understanding of how, you know, we think differently in different situations and how to apply that. Um, so yeah, I think the two, like biology and psychology are tied together so much. You can separate them into different fields, but I think that they're so closely linked that getting to see how these two um, apply and practice all the time is just super interesting. <laughs> That's fascinating to have that degree in your undergraduate years and then still be relying on that and, and still be impacted by that. It's really refreshing. <laughs> Within clinical practice, have you faced any situations where you have really had to advocate uh, for a patient? All the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's fundamental to being a nurse, too, which is something that I love, you know, because families, especially when you think about pediatric care, you know, parents are the experts in knowing their child. You know, they know what's going wrong subtly with their child before anybody else does. And they see that child every single day and they can pick up on those cues. So I think a lot of times it's just being an active listener and really um, partnering with the parents to say, okay, what are your concerns or what are your challenges or what are your worries here? And then just stopping and listening. And then I think once you put that together with your knowledge from the medical side to say, okay, across every single patient I've ever seen and with what this family is telling me, where does this fit in? Do I offer 
reassurance to let them know, okay, this sounds normal, but let me, let's talk about kind of what you said and how and why. And so that mm-hmm. they feel comfortable knowing that this is a normal thing, or is this something that they're worried about and this is not normal for their child and it's completely different. And then, you know, you take that forward to the rest of the team and advocate and say, you know what, the family's telling me this and um, I'm concerned also, and this is why. So I think being that voice and helping parents to be able to advocate for their child is a really important role, I think, especially in pediatrics and nursing. Um, Mm. But it's something I enjoy doing. I think, you know, it's amazing when you have your, when your patients are pediatric and they come with parents who are so passionate about helping this child to have the best outcome. It's like you have this great partner in healthcare to be able to help achieve that good outcomes for your patient. So it's really, it's something that I enjoy in my role is getting to advocate on behalf of my patients, but also the parents to, you know, really help the kids have the most positive experience that they can. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. And as you're being that mediator and as you're in that role, um, there's the potential to experience burnout. Uh, Could you talk a little bit about how you keep alive your love for medicine um, and avoid burnout in the workplace? Sure. You know, I think, you know, especially thinking about the last several years with COVID, um, you know, there's there's a lot of burnout in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to think about, you know, you personally, because you can't take the best care of your patients if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not getting sleep, if you're constantly anxious, if you're constantly stressed, it's going to be hard to give your best when you're at the workplace. And so I think always prioritizing that and knowing when you're at work, you're on, you're there for your patients. When you go home, of course, you're going to think about things about work, but you know, you can't do anything about them typically (laughs) once you go home (laughs) if you're not on call, you know, Mm -hmm. so you have to find ways to be able to Um, to take care of yourself too. So I think that's super important. Um, I think for me, having a dual role really keeps me invigorated and re-energized with both, um, both the clinical care as well as the research, because I think either one can burn you out. You know, research, when you're writing paper after paper after manuscript after manuscript, (laughs) like that can be a lot. You know, Mm -hmm. patient care, 40 plus hours a week, and, you know, just kind of patient after patient after patient after patient, that can be Um, challenging and draining depending upon what situation you're in. Um, Some people absolutely love that 40 hours a week. Um, I'm kind of more introverted. I recharge by having a little bit of downtime. (laughs) So to actually get that at work where I get some of that recharge from my other role is kind of cool um, Mm -hmm. because I'm able to kind of refocus, have that quiet time, focus on the other, you know, aspect of my job. But then when that aspect gets kind of boring and I'm like, man, I just need to like talk to a human and remember why I'm doing all this (laughs) other work. Um, Getting to do the patient care, I think is really uh, so invigorating. And that's always the core of why I do what I do. You know, always thinking about, you know, what's best for the patient, I think is what drives everything else. But it's cool to get to do both roles because I think just for me as an individual, it keeps me, you know, really um, energized for both roles. And one role is just constantly feeding into the other, which is really cool. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, when you're, when you're not in the hospital, what creative loves do you have outside of the workplace and outside of that space? Yeah. So I love music. I actually, when I was like in fourth grade, started playing flute. <laughs> so, um, I played in different orchestras, um, over the years, um, was a member of the Cincinnati Civic Orchestra, which is an all volunteer adult orchestra that gives free concerts across Cincinnati. So wow. that's super fun. Um, and let's see, this isn't as much creative, but I love <clears throat> nature, like being outdoors, hiking, traveling, um, you know, just meeting people from different places, different cultures, you know, all of that. I just think those are um, some of the things that I really enjoy outside of work and hospital. <laughs> And it's great to explore those and, and to have other loves outside of the practice of medicine to, to keep you to keep you alive and to keep that love for medicine and your job alive, too. I want to look a little bit into the world of research as a nurse. So in the mid-1950s, uh, the polio epidemics began to spring up every year. Dr. Jonas Salk developed an initial vaccine, uh, but parents still feared that it would cause infantile paralysis. Dr. Sabin is uh, credited for creating a safer oral polio vaccine. His work at Cincinnati Children's would almost completely eradicate polio worldwide. Children's takes great pride in coming uh, from that line. Could you explain the importance of medical research 
and why it must be regularly conducted. Definitely. Um, you know, and at Cincinnati Children's, we have a huge research division. Um, we have over 17,000 employees here currently, and about <laughs> I think a third of them are engaged in research. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So it's a really big part of what we do. Um, and I think something that is that we're super proud of. And I think because research is so much the foundation of practice and and it helps us improve health and health care, that's why it's so important. You know, without research, practice wouldn't evolve. Um, we wouldn't be able to prevent, treat, or cure so many of the different diseases, you know, that we've been able to come up with treatments and prevention and cures for. And so, you know, research is really what drives practice forward and improves care. So I think that's why it's such an important part of healthcare. And how did you, I know we've talked about it before, of you beginning your role um, as a research assistant and kind of beginning to implement clinical practice and research as well, but how did you first fall in love with medical research? How did that kind of develop over time? Yeah, so I think that internship that I got to do while I was still in college after my junior year at the Jackson Laboratory, I think that was where I really started to learn what research was, what it looked like day to day, and the impact that it could have on clinical care. Um, and so that was the beginnings of when I really became interested in research. It's definitely evolved over time as I learned kind of more the translational spectrum of research mm -hmm. and how you can really be involved kind of in the outcomes, you know, aspects of uh, research too. Um, but yeah, I think getting to do an undergraduate research internship, I think made such a difference in my entire career pathway, just because that wasn't something that I'd really considered or really thought about a lot until I spent that summer doing it. And then I was like, well, this is pretty cool. <laughs> like, I enjoy this. Yeah. Why do you believe it's important for nurses to lead and to be part of healthcare innovation? Yeah, you know, I think for nurses, working in healthcare um, and being, you know, so close to the patient who is ultimately the person that we're trying to see the best outcome for, you know, nurses intuitively understand the strengths and the weaknesses and the challenges that exist in our medical systems, our workflows, our processes, our products, like they intuitively know all this stuff just because they work with it every single day. And so they really understand it really well. And nurses are the largest group of healthcare professionals um, in the country, you know, over 4 million nurses in the USA. Um, so when we think about how do we really improve a complex healthcare system that really has so many needs, because there's a mm -hmm. lot going on in healthcare that needs to be changed and needs to be improved to be sustainable and better. Um, nurses understand the system so well. They're so passionate about what they do and they have the training to do this, you know, through different degrees. Um, so I think when you th when I think about healthcare innovation, I think nurses and really other clinicians too should really be at the forefront of healthcare innovation, hmm. um, because virtually anything that we want to implement across healthcare settings is going to involve nurses. It's going to involve our other clinicians. So we should be right there helping to design these things, giving our input, um, and making sure that what we create really works when you put it into the real world. <laughs> For sure. And where do you think we are headed within the world of medical researchers? Um, what advances do you see in the next few years with how we conduct research? Yeah, I think technology is going to continue to play an increasingly important role. Um, of course, you know, there's all these things out there, right? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data. We have access to so much data now. Um, but we really need healthcare workers and other professionals, I think, who really understand these areas in addition to really understand patient care extremely well. Mm. And we don't have as many of those people as we need. We have some. <laughs> um, but I think really having healthcare workers who are trained and cross-trained in these different disciplines, you know, design, engineering, computer programming, understand that world, also understand the healthcare world, or at least have the education to really be super collaborative and engaged in working with people who have those backgrounds, I think that that's going to be super important if we want to be able to leverage technology to its fullest. Mm -hmm. um, because these can't be created well in isolation, you know, if we're sitting in 
you know, a in a company, you know, far removed from the patient, just trying to come up with algorithms that somehow work for healthcare workers and patients. It just doesn't work. <laughs> right. Um, so when I think of the future of healthcare, there's so many opportunities, um, particularly with technology, but I think we have to really design it in a way that works um, well for everyone, you know, and that is also equitable. Like that's a huge thing that you have to think about because mm -hmm. algorithms that we create are really subject to bias. And so you have to consider, you know, so many different aspects when you think about the future of technology and healthcare. <laughs> and you need that integration. You can't just be that company that's removed trying to come up with ideas, but you have to be um, in contact with the population and target audience as well. Definitely. <laughs> um, your story is one of going against the norm with um, pursuing that DNP program and then also uh, conducting outcome-based research. What advice do you have to the young innovators out there beginning their journey into healthcare? People who are maybe in college or people who are just starting um, their journey to healthcare but have that innovative spirit, innovative mindset. Yeah, I think there's not just one track that you have to follow in healthcare. And that's not something I saw or knew when I was in high school or even in college. I sort of saw there's nurses, there's doctors, there's physical therapists. You know, you saw all these different roles, mm -hmm. but you didn't actually know all these different pieces and components of what they could do or the potential of what the future needs out of all these different roles. Mm -hmm. And so I think seeing that there are so many different opportunities out there, take time to to shadow people, to listen to podcasts, you know, and get this education. Um, reach out to individuals who are doing the type of work that you envision wanting to do. Because with the complexity of healthcare, we need people who are skilled um, in so many different areas to help improve this system. And so I think um, the sky's the limit, <laughs> right? When you think about how many different things that we could have in terms of healthcare roles in the future and how many different things companies need. So um, not being afraid to be kind of bold and say, I see an opportunity and I think that there is a role that I could uniquely fill in this space. And um, I might not get there right away, but I'm going to work to build it because I think that's something that I would be super energized to wake up every day and go do and you know mm. make that impact on the world. <laughs> what practical advice can an aspiring nurse practitioner take in their undergraduate years? Someone who's also just beginning their journey, is there anything that they can do now for hands-on experience or anything like that? Sure, you know, I think some people um, do like the nursing assistant role and find that really helpful, just where you're able to get in the hospital environment and begin to learn about the career more. Um, and I think, you know, medical research, you know, for me, that was definitely a pivotal <laughs> experience <laughs> in getting to have that exposure, even though initially I thought, oh, I probably want to do patient care all the time, that totally changed what I thought about what I wanted to do um, in healthcare. So, you know, getting some of these more diverse experiences in healthcare um, when you're younger, whether it's a formal internship or just talking to people and learning about it, I think is super helpful. Um, nursing school in particular, lots of studying. <laughs> you yeah. learn so many things um, and you'll learn a million more once you become a nurse and you're in healthcare and mm -hmm. you're applying them and they don't follow the textbook exactly, so that's okay. You just <laughs> work to learn that. It's a continual um, learning, I think, as a career in healthcare, which is great. Um, and I would say, you know, look for areas that you're passionate about because there's just so many different opportunities in nursing and in healthcare. So you may not always get there in your very first job, and that's okay. You know, you'll build on mm -hmm. that foundation, but continue to look for something that you're excited to wake up and do because there are just so many different pathways and opportunities that, you know, why spend so many hours of your life working in something that you're like, I just collect a paycheck and go home when mm -hmm. you could seek out and find something that really is something that you are like, this is awesome. Like I like going to work. It's pretty cool. <laughs> the passion that drives you daily. Yeah. What encouragement would you give to an aspiring healthcare professional? Yeah, I think healthcare is just such a great field. And I, I know I've said it several times, but there are so many opportunities. Um, and so I think just, again, just knowing yourself, and that takes a while. I think when I was 
18 or 22 <laughs> finishing college. Um, it's been a continual journey of kind of knowing what I would like to do and where I would fit best and what I want to do next. And that continues to evolve. Um, and so I think, you know, taking that time to understand what would be interesting and fulfilling for you in this field and then going out and looking for it and fighting it. I think all mm -hmm. of that um, is just really, it can really change. It, it can really change and make a difference in the way that you see your career and how you experience your profession and just really your kind of job satisfaction in general <laughs> with, with your career. For sure. And just in closing, do you have any additional advice for those beginning their medical journey? Yeah, I think, you know, Kind of just as I mentioned before, talking with lots of people, just because the roles are so diverse, you'll get, you know, 10 different people, 10 different stories. And so that can help you to build and craft kind of what you want to do next. And I think I talked about it a little bit, um, but mentorship was huge for me. Um, I've had at least five, if not like 10 <laughs> different mentors <laughs> across, I'd say from high school time until now, who have really made such an impact in my life and really changed um, kind of what I thought was possible at different points in my career mm -hmm. and changed how I saw myself and like what the opportunities would be in the future. Um, mentors, they help connect you. You know, they share things that um, you can't read online. You know, you can't find this advice that's tailored just to you by, you know, somebody who really cares about you and wants to see you succeed and wants to see you get to that next level. Like you mm -hmm. have to have those personal relationships to be able to um, really have that kind of growth. And so I think seeking out mentors and um, I think anytime I found a mentor who where we just really um, aligned kind of on our interests and then they were able to see things in me that I just didn't see yet. I'm like, well, that's nice. They think that, but like I'm brand new. How can they <laughs> see that already? Um, but I think, you know, when you have those types of mentors, like believing that from their personal experience that what they see is possible and just keep working and driving towards that. But I think mentorship is so important and helpful, especially in the medical field. Um, mm -hmm. I think it'll really help you kind of to get to that next level. <laughs> For sure. I found it so valuable in my own life too. And as I'm growing in the undergraduate years, and there's a lot that you need to to figure out having people who are further along in the journey and who are influencing and, and giving you advice is so, so valuable. Well, it's just been an absolute pleasure to sit down with you, to delve into the world of the clinical research nurse, to, to look into that role, look at your innovative projects, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was great to talk with you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Voices from Healthcare. This podcast seeks to give practical advice to aspiring healthcare professionals and encourage those within the healthcare field. If you appreciate the message and mission of this podcast, leave a rating and review on the platform you are listening to and make sure to follow the podcast so that you do not miss out on future episodes. It really does help spread the word within the podcasting world. Tune in on January 3rd as we explore the unique world of pediatric emergency medicine. We explore trauma cases that may be seen on the floor, ethical dilemmas, and vital decisions that may impact a patient's life. We look into the fast-paced nature of the ER, as well as the value of effective collaboration within the department. We will touch on the valuable experience of a doctor-turned-patient and tools to combat compassion fatigue. She will share how she balances compassion and competency well and constantly seeks to inspire the next generation of healthcare professionals. Feel free to send me professions you want me to interview, questions you have, or neat stories you want to share with me. You can email me at voicesfromhealthcare at gmail.com. You can also check out the podcast Instagram page at voicesfromhc. Here I'll post important updates about season launches, episode information, and more. Although this podcast seeks to be informative, information discussed cannot be taken in place of medical advice.